So, what the fuck even is anti-civ? Like, I see a lot of people talking shit about it all the time online, and almost all of it is completely ill-informed. Um, so, what I'm trying to do with this, like, video or video essay or whatever this is, is to try and actually explain what anti-civ anarchy is. Um, I see a lot of misrepresentation of anti-civ online, ranging from extremely bad faith engagements from people who haven't actually read anything written by anti-civ people, to the mislabeling of all anti-civ and green anarchists as anarcho-primitivists or primies or whatever, to the grouping of green anarchists with eco-fascists for some reason, in a way which often requires telling outright lies about green anarchists and which also misunderstands a lot of the threat and aims of genuine actual eco-fascists. I'll get into some of that more a bit later, because I think it's something that needs to be spoken about. I want to try and get something out there which presents some of the basic elements of anti civ to people in a more accessible way than, you know, the usual um, zine articles, which are the main way in which a lot of modern anti civ thought is disseminated. You'll see a lot of stuff, which is zine articles, which are then like put onto anarchistlibrary.org or something like that. And then maybe some obscure blogs which people own. Not that I'm probably going to be any less obscure, but whatever. I should probably be a bit more open from the outset and saying that I am a green anarchist, despite the red on the flag back there. I'm probably drifting a bit more towards post-civilization and post-civ. Um, that still falls under the anti-civ umbrella, but is a bit different from primitivism or orthodox anti-civ, if that's even a thing that exists. A lot of my explanation about different types of anti-civ thought are going to be pretty heavily biased by my own opinions and I think it would be disingenuous to pretend that it's not going to be. So I often recommend a particular Tumblr post to people who are looking to learn about Green Anarchy, which is called Green Anarchy 101, I'll link it down in the description, uh, which describes Green Anarchy, of which anti is is kind of subgroup, uh, as anarchism with an ecological slash land-based focus, anarchism that seeks balance with the natural world. Green Anarchy includes, but is not limited to, anarcho-primitivism, anti-civilization thought, uh, some strains of nihilist anarchism, Germany has a lot of relationships with nihilist anarchism, and uh, post-civilization thought. Uh, most of these are contained within anti-civ thought, so I, people would usually describe anarcho-primitivism and post-civ as anti-civ, rather than seeing anti-civ and primitivism as opposed, for example. There are a few kind of foundational texts of green anarchy, but it doesn't really tend to have the same kind of reverence for specific thinkers or specific groups that, like, Marxism or other kinds of leftism tend to have. Well, for example, it would never call itself Perlmanism. If pressed, I think almost every green anarchist who has done some serious reading would cite writers and texts like Freddie Perlman's um, Against History Against Leviathan, as well as a few of his other stuff, and Jacques Matt's, um Against Domestication. and. Some other writers and thinkers like John Zerzan, who very much picked up the torch after Perlman died. And I think a lot of people would see those people as kind of central to the creation and the spreading of green anarchy and anti-civilization thought, but wouldn't have the same kind of reverence for and dogmatism around that you might find in leftist strains of thought. There's also kind of the figure of Ted Kaczynski looming large over a lot of this. Uh, he's very popular in online discourse around anti-civ, and a lot of people will reference industrial society in its future, uh, kind of in the vague online anti-civ and green anarchist community, but in my opinion his actual influence is pretty minimal beyond a kind of edgy meminess around him. Um, he doesn't really say all that much that's particularly new, especially for when he was writing, and I think really has more influence on general anti-tech and more the deep green side of things than green anarchist which there's a there's a certain amount of overlap but they are they are two separate things in my opinion he's probably more popular as a meme than like some kind of intellectual leader or anything like that but i'm sure people will disagree with me it's important to remember as well that green anarchy is very heavily influenced by, and in some ways is just an offshoot of more individualist strains of anarchism, 
Many of the green anarchists you meet will also variously self-describe as egoists, and insurrectionists, post-leftists, or even refuse to describe as anything other than anarchists. You might find some anarchists without adjectives and stuff like that. Um, for example, I, I fall under some of these labels, I think, most of the time. It changes. There are certainly green anarchists, though, who are more influenced by, like, anarcho-syndicalism and, like, Kropotkinite anarcho-communism, but those strains of anarchism have historically tended towards methods and ideals which a lot of anti safe anarchists would describe as kind of domesticated or would criticise as being too focused on critiques of just capitalism uh, rather than civilization or class society altogether, as well as being kind of too uncritical of industry itself and the ways in which industry can damage the biosphere, etc, etc. So you won't get a lot of the same rhetoric around, like, uh, workers' control of the means of production, for example. It's critical to remember above all else that anti civ it's itself not actually a program or a practice, but rather a critique of civilization and domestication. Anti civ and green anarchists can be found doing a lot of forms of common anarchist praxis and activities in general, so like most anti civilization anarchists that I know are also committed anti fascists, and most of them will be active in a lot of street protest movements, especially if they're city based. If they're not, then they might be based more around like land reclamation or rewilding efforts, things like that, um, as well as I don't know, opposition to infrastructure projects which might damage the environment in which they live, etc. The only places you probably won't see anti civ people involved is anything approaching kind of a political party, or they might be involved in some formal political organizations, but in some way that's a bit more through pragmatism than anything else. And that might differ a lot in the US, for example, because um, in the UK, the uh, the UK scene is a bit too small to be properly internally sectarian in the way the US kind of syndicalist individualist split exists. We don't have that so much here. There aren't really enough of us. So, what is civilization? Um, what is green anarchy? Is an is an earlier attempt at explaining green anarchy to people. Um, published originally in Green Anarchy magazine, funnily enough, and it opens by saying, We are not interested in developing a new ideology, nor perpetuating a singular worldview. We also understand that not all green anarchists are specifically anti-civilization, but we do have a hard time understanding how one can be against all domination without getting to its roots. Civilization itself. That last phrase to me explains a central part of what anti-civ is. The idea that civilization itself is the root of all domination. And in fact, most anti civ folks will probably define civilization as such, usually referring to it using some kind of reference to hierarchical society and domestication, or maybe domination, or things along those lines. Very common anarchist phrases, except domestication, which I'll explain in a second. This actually brings up an issue which I'll dis discuss a bit later, namely the problematic nature of trying to define civilization as a tangible thing, or attempting to define which societies were or were not civilized, especially given the history of referring to a certain group of people as uncivilized and in a pejorative way, especially by Westerners and colonizers. Green anarchists tend to blame civilization for almost every problem in our current society, because it is our current society which I think is um, usually an accurate assessment, but can sometimes rely on an idealized view of how pre-civilization humans lived. In fact, I think that the way in which green anarchists and anti civ anarchists refer to civilization uh, can often be remarkably similar to the concept which other anarchists refer to as class society. I've mentioned this a bit earlier. In that it extends the critique of society beyond just capitalism, but also refuses any society which is not based on total freedom. Uh, anti civ also tends to be leveling a lot of the same criticisms of our current society as those who criticize mass society, but mass society tends to refer to kind of a post industrialized society. Fulfi Landstroker, so probably just massacred his name, has a pretty good grasp on this idea, saying that. An anarchist and revolutionary critique of civilization does not begin from any comparison to other societies or to any future ideal. It begins from my confrontation, from your confrontation, with the immediate reality of civilization in our lives here and now. 
It is the recognition that the totality of social relationships that we call civilization can only exist by stealing our lives from us and breaking them down into bits that the ruling order can use in its own reproduction. So domestication and leviathan, I said I would explain domestication earlier. These are two very linked concepts. A central part to the understanding and development of the idea of domestication is encapsulated in, I think, the end of the first paragraph of Jacques Comat's essay against domestication, written in 1973. As he says, all the conditions would seem to be right. There should be revolution. Why then is there such restraint? What is to stop people from transforming all these crises and disasters, which themselves are the result of the latest mutation of capital, into a catastrophe for capital itself? This is something which I'm sure has occurred to many revolutionaries and even many others. Kamat argues, however, that professional revolutionaries and activists are just domesticated as what he calls the silent majority. This is because most of the time they are themselves fighting for a society which will continue the death machine that is civilization and capital. He only points towards the youth as being the non or least domesticated portions of humanity, which makes a lot of sense in the context of the uprisings of 1968 and the coming insurrections of the 70s after he'd written it. In fact, a large part of the essay which I've just mentioned is dedicated to analysis of May 68 and general events of that year, which I will probably make a separate video at some point about May 68 and also the uprisings in Italy in 77-78. Freddie Pullman explores a similar idea to domestication in much of his like epic poem slash magnum opus book, which essentially created an anti civ thought called Against History Against Leviathan, I've mentioned it earlier. He instead uses a concept called Leviathanic Armour. So Leviathan in A Hal refers to what anti civ folks call civilization, and they sometimes also use the word Leviathan. I do, it's nice. It refers to Thomas Hobbes Leviathan which kind of refers to the state, or society in general, uh, or the nation. Similar in ways to the idea of the body politic, he imagines it as a physical body with, for example, the king at the head, and then the populace making up the rest of the body. It was a very common um, idea in early modern England, which is when Hobbes was writing. So Leviathanic armour, then, is basically the idea of a person donning some kind of layer over their wild human self. So it encompasses the idea of kind of protecting yourself, but then also you're hiding yourself and trapping yourself within this, this shell at the same time. So it's a multi-layered concept. Um, Perlman refers to people removing their leviathanic armour at various stages in the book, uh, notably when early Christianity first starts to emerge before it takes on the characteristics of Leviathan itself in the form of like the, the Catholic Church, for example. So he, he considers early Christianity around the time of Jesus' life and then a bit afterwards when it was still very much more like liberatory than it became later on as kind of anti-Leviathan and seeking to leave Leviathan. He refers to it a few other times in similar ways, kind of with like the Hussites and other Christian heretical groups, uh, as well as removing that armour Pullman also mentions people putting it on. For example, when a, when a few of the early Bronze Age civilizations start to emerge, he talks about people gradually donning the Leviathanic armor kind of over time. Uh, importantly, he includes Moses in this, who begins as someone leading his followers away from civilization uh, in the form of Pharaoh's Egypt, which they're leaving, and towards Israel and into the wilderness. But he ends up as, and I quote, an armoured man who is unable to remove his armour, driven by his hatred of Pharaoh into creating a new king of kings and a new leviathan. He then actually directly compares Moses to Lenin, which I'll link it in the description, it's an interesting little bit in there. Uh, what, he, what he's getting at here is basically the idea that people remove themselves from their leviathanic armour, in the sense that they undomesticate themselves, or rewild themselves even. Uh, when they become free and when they rebel against the world in which they live, and that takes many different forms across time, depending on the exact shape of the leviathan which they are fighting against. That's a concept in the book, there are different forms of leviathan, there's like a, there's a giant worm, which is how he refers to land-born militaristic leviathans, and there is the giant octopus, which is how he refers to commerce and trade-based uh, sea-born maritime leviathans, and then there's eventually the idea of the two merging in the form of, for example, the British Empire or something like that, into both worm and octopus, or the American Empire as well. 
Interestingly, Pullman also emphasizes the idea of people trying to leave Leviathan and sees people who have removed their armor as the people who are able to imagine and understand the world outside of Leviathan, rather than those who are directly trying to kill it from within. So he understands that you don't simply kill civilization, you don't, you don't destroy it in place, but you actually have to extricate yourself from it. He often refers to people like removing themselves from the corpse of the Leviathan and being outside it, or people coming from outside it to attack it. So, anti of the Enlightenment and Modernism. Green Anarchy also tends to find itself heavily in opposition to what's called anthropocentrism, uh, usually opposing it with biocentrism or some form of ecologism. Uh, green Anarchists tend to, and I'm going to be saying tend to because making generalizations is difficult here, uh, they tend to be opposed to humanism in general, as well as the myth of progress, which grew out of the Western Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries. Biocentrism, crucially, does not reject humanity or human society as things, but rather seeks to place it in balance with other aspects and other forms of life. So anthropocentrism is criticised by green anarchists for placing humans above all other forms of life and obviously also as placing Western white humans above all others. Uh, most anti-civilization anarchists also either reject outright or are intensely critical of science and scientism in particular. Particularly the idea of science as being capable of being in any way neutral or detached, as kind of only being able to see some kind of inherent or absolute truth. Uh, they reject the possibility of genuinely detaching oneself from like that which one observes and highly doubt anyone's ability to engage in genuine objective observation. This builds up to a critique of science as practiced popularly, which is fairly common that, that science is presented as the arbiter and presenter of absolute truth, while being fundamentally shaped by the conditions in which and the people who it is practiced by. The anti civ critique of progress is also very importantly simultaneously a critique of other forms of anarchism. Um, many anti civ folks view anarchism, meaning the 19th and 20th century ideological movement, as essentially the libertarian extreme of the European Enlightenment. Post left and anti civ and green anarchists will often uh, just use the word anarchy, so it's why I've been using green anarchy throughout most of this. They don't like saying anarchism quite a lot of the time because they feel that refers specifically to an ideology. While this doesn't mean for most of us that it's time to just totally throw out everything anyone's ever said or written or done for anarchy up to this point in that tradition, it does mean taking a really seriously critical eye to it. Bakunin, for example, among some of his other failings, is fundamentally and militantly pro-science and pro-rationalism. This is one of the many connections which anti-civilization thought has with the post-left, which levels similar criticisms against almost all leftists, including the idea that the revolution has become, for many, essentially a stand-in for the idea of like the biblical apocalypse, and communism, the kind of promised or promised reward or heaven for the faithful. This is not to say, though, that anti-civilization thought and green anarchy are anti-religion in any way, but it would probably be accurate to describe most of them as anti-clerical or anti-church, as being against organised religion in general, but not opposed to, like, religious belief. A lot of the anti civ attitude towards anthropocentrism can be summarised, I think, uh, by one of my favourite quotes from the amazing essay, Desert. In my mother tongue, deserts are uninhabitable, abandoned, deserted. But by whom? Not by the coyotes or the cactus wrens, not by the harvester ants or the rattlesnakes. Not by the Namib quicksteps, the meerkats, the acacias, the tars, the sound grouse, and the red kangaroos. Deserts and arid environments generally are often biologically diverse, though by their nature the life is sparser than in other biomes. While some desert areas are lifeless, in most communities of animals, birds, insects, bacteria, and plants, run, fly, crawl, spread, and grow in lives unordered and undomesticated by civilization. Wilderness is in us and all around us. The battle to contain and control it is the constant labour of civilization. When that battle is lost and the fields are deserted, wilderness persists. This means basically that even in those places where humans feel they can't be sustained, and of course this really means places where capital and civilization can't be sustained, life persists in far greater numbers and variety than we would be led to believe by the common perception of what a desert is.
there's a quote which sticks with me a lot from the book Overstory, which is about the late 80s and early 90s forest defenders in the Western United States. Reason is what's turning all the forests of the world into rectangles. It reminds me that things like reason, words like common sense and sensible, which have come to just mean correct in our world, are actually very much products of the society in which they've been created. This is more the anti of critique of science than anything else. The critique of an attempt to see the world without passion or emotion, which ends up missing everything about the world, which is fundamentally about passion and emotion. And that in a society like ours, the removal of emotion and passion really only leaves the desire for profit at the expense of everything else. anti of climate change and eco-fascism. So this is the big bit. I have to do a lot of dispelling of myths here. So hopefully I can do some explaining of things which people tend to misrepresent online. Obviously, for something which grew out of green anarchy and something which is in large part a critique of industrialized society, anti civ thought spends a lot of time grappling with the idea of global warming and climate change. While there can sometimes be a feeling that certain anti civ and green anarchists almost relish the coming collapse caused by climate change, it certainly isn't a part of anti civ thought to rely on or want catastrophic climate change to happen. It's more that people are becoming aware that catastrophic climate change is kind of inevitable and irreversible at this point, and that the way forward now is to find ways to deal with that reality and to prevent climate change from being any worse than it has to, to prevent it from becoming serious runaway climate change. One of the central aspects of this for me and for many other green anarchist folks is resistance to ecofascism as a response to climate change. That is, the tendency for the state and many proclaimed green activists to respond to climate change and the damage it will do to social structures by intensifying state control of our lives and of nature. This includes, of course, things like stricter border controls in response to the increasing number of climate refugees fleeing from the global south, which is being and will be more directly affected by climate change in a lot of ways, as well as the tendency to describe problems in terms of overpopulation, usually with a fixation on Chinese and Indian population growth, rather than the problems of overconsumption, which are far more intense in the West, usually as a way to shift the blame away from the West and onto the United States and its allies' geopolitical enemies. anti civ folks often get blamed for this rhetoric coming up, and are straw man as supporting it, but this is more a case in my experience of people who say these things being described as anti-civilization by other people, rather than actual green anarchists and anti civ folks saying it themselves. This is a pretty consistent issue, and one which I think stems from a lot of eco-fascists and green-minded traditionalist reactionaries stating a desire to return to a kind of pre-capitalist or pre-modern economy. But this is usually a kind of romanticised traditionalist agrarianism. If you've ever seen the Tumblr or Twitter accounts of a lot of reactionaries and neo-Nazis, you will have seen those pictures of blonde Aryan women in kind of faux traditional Germanic clothing wandering through fields of wheat, which they all seem to love posting all the time which to many is synonymous with destroying civilization, precisely because Western civilization and capitalism are the same things to them. That said, there are definitely some types who claim the title of anti-civilization and also hold fascist ideas. Some of the deep green types come to mind, and national anarchists are definitely a thing which exists, although their actual dedication to anarchy rather than just wanting to adopt anarchist tactics like the Black Bloc or non-hierarchical organization is kind of debatable. So I don't want to pretend that it's completely inaccurate to say that some people who call themselves anti-civ are also fascist or reactionary assholes, nor do I want to fall into a kind of no true Scotsman fallacy, but I do want to point out that there is a fundamental contradiction between holding almost any fascistic or nationalist beliefs, while also having a proper critique of civilization, domination, and domestication. Hopefully I've done enough earlier to explain that green anarchists and the anti civ critique are just as opposed to the forms of domination and the hierarchies which created those societies, as much as the societal structures green anarchists are opposed to in our current society. I owe a lot of my understanding of what constitutes fascism to Umberto Eco via his essay Ur Fascism, which I was finally forced to read by the hosts of the podcast Blood and Turf, which pretty much constantly refer to Ur fascism when talking about the similarities and links which a lot of anti-trans rhetoric from the Christian right and the trans-exclusionary feminist movement have with both each other and with fascist rhetoric around the preservation of traditional gender roles as a response to the threat of trans people. 
one of Echo's most important points is contained within this quote. Fascism became an all-purpose term because one can eliminate from a fascist regime one or more features, and it will still be recognisable as fascist. Take away imperialism from fascism and you still have Franco and Salazar. Take away colonialism and you still have the Balkan fascism of the Ustashis. Add to the Italian fascism a radical anti-capitalism, which never much fascinated Mussolini, and you have Ezra Pound. Add a cult of Celtic mythology and the Grail mysticism, completely alien to official fascism, and you have the most respected fascist gurus, Julius Evola. Echo then goes on to set out a few key features of fascism, which may or may not be a part of all fascist movements, but which all share at least some of these features, and therefore can be identified as part of the same fascist umbrella. Ecofascism, in the ways that it is manifesting in the world today, usually contain at least a few of these elements. The first is common to the vast majority of fascist movements, and that's the culture of tradition. Of course, this is not common to all ecofascisms, as is Echo's point in the earlier quote, but it is important to many ecofascisms. You can see this in, for example, the more kind of new agey ecofascists' veneration of neo paganism and of old Celtic and Germanic mysticism in a way which is intrinsically connected to occultism. This is called a culture tradition partially because it's almost always venerating an idealised version of what Celtic and Germanic society was, based on a kind of 19th century romanticist and nationalist myth, rather than a more nuanced understanding that isn't being used to justify the violence and domination of nationalism and white supremacy. Echo's second identified characteristic of fascism is the rejection of modernity. This obviously isn't common to all forms of fascism, as anyone familiar with Italian fascism and close connection to futurism knows, but is a characteristic of a lot of the fascism which a mistaken for anti-civilization thought. I think this is basically the reason behind a lot of those memes which you see, like, reject modernity, embrace monkey, which... Hilarious, like, they've, they've basically been reclaimed by other people now, because they're, they're good. But they originated from, like, fascists online. Uh, it's the same with the, this is what they took from you, the kind of weird, what's it called, retro wave aesthetics. Yeah. It's important to note that this is, like, a very different rejection of modernity to what you find in anti-civ and green anarchy. It's a rejection just of modernity, and a return to a previously existing thing, which is still a deeply hierarchical society based on domination, which is not what anti-civ is, but when you look at it in a very shallow, surface-level way, there are some similarities, and I think it's something which actually anti-civ and green anarchists should be very aware of and very careful of, but I think it's more important not to just concern ourselves with making sure that we're super, super careful about what we say around that, but more to make sure that in other ways we're being very obvious that we're not fascists, being very obvious that we are anti-fascists, which many of us are actively. So, anti civ and primitivism. Something which I see floating around the internet a lot in conversations about anti civ is the conflation of anarcho primitivism with anti civilization. This isn't true at all. The thing to remember is that all primies are anti civ, but not all anti civ folks are primies. For example, I am definitely not a primitivist. I've taken inspiration from primitivism in some aspects because of conversations with friends who are primies, but I am definitely anti civ. Wolfie Landstreicher takes a pretty extreme position on this, as he does with most things. Uh, in his essay, A Critique, Not a Program, for a non-primitivist anti-civilization critique, saying that anti-civ is not always even connected to a critique of technology or progress, which kind of defeats the entire point of my earlier section on anti-civ and modernism, but it just goes to show the extent of the internal diversity of literally every single strain of anarchy. Primitivism tends to take two forms. Either it's the use of so-called primitive societies, aka existing indigenous societies or past societies which existed in what are now civilized areas, to critique civilization, which is a pretty common practice even amongst people who aren't anti-civ in any way, and has even managed to become kind of commodified to some extent with the form of things like paleo diets and barefoot style shoes, which capital is inescapable, you know. Hopefully the issues with this kind of approach are fairly evident. The most obvious to me is that it's often, but not 
always involves a certain amount of fetishization and romanticization of indigenous societies, usually in a way which considers them as like relics of the past rather than as societies and peoples who still exist in our current world and have changed over time. This often goes hand in hand with an over-reliance on anthropology as a field of study, without the level of criticism you'd hope for from anarchists when it comes to using information coming from mainstream academia. The second form of primitivism, which is the one most people are talking about when they conflate primitivism with anti civ thought, is the idea of using primitive societies as a model for some future way of living. This has similar issues to the other form, but also adds to it the idea of longing for a kind of return to Eden ending up often being overly utopian and also brushing aside the problems that arise when trying to think of how this proposed way of living would come into existence. This is, in my opinion, the only place where the generally overly simplistic criticisms of anti civ around the loss of genuinely useful technologies actually have a place. There are, of course, answers to those criticisms, usually using evidence of how people in the past solve problems in their lives in ways we wouldn't think of nowadays. But in my opinion, this issue will always arise when you fundamentally base your vision of what future life should be like on a civilised understanding of what past societies look like, rather than trying to build anarchy in the present day with what we have and what we can do. I do realise, by the way, that this whole section has basically just been me talking shit about primitivism in a pretty blatantly biased way, but this is my video, I can do what I want. I said I was going to do this at the beginning of the video, so. I do actually have a lot of respect for primitivism, like I said earlier, and I think there are definitely valuable things to gain from examinations of societies which aren't or weren't civilised, but I think it should be done in a really heavily critical way, and also in a way which understands that these are existing, changing societies a lot of the time. So, post-civilization thought. Um, Posts have kind of emerged from existing critiques of anti-civ and primitivism from within Green Anarchy. It still holds that civilization should be dismantled, but it does away with any desire to go back to anything which existed before now. Post-civ is also decidedly less anti-tech than most other ideologies which fall under the anti-civ umbrella, and it can be criticised for taking aboard some of the more bad faith arguments against primitivism in my opinion. For example, like accusing primies of being anti-tech. In the following quote, primitivists reject technology. We just reject the inappropriate use of technology. Now, to be fair, that's almost all the uses of technology we see in the civilized world, but our issue with, with most primitivist theory is one of babies and bathwater. Sure, most technologies are being put to rather evil uses, whether warfare or simple ecocide, but that doesn't make technology, the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, inherently evil. This isn't an entirely fair description of the primitivist attitude towards technology, nor do I think their definition of technology is really the best there, but it does summarise the distinction fairly well, I think. post crucially, doesn't desire a return to a kind of pre-civilised state, simultaneously not thinking that it's possible to return to a kind of pre-lapsarian state from before when humans became civilised, nor is it possible to place a clean dividing point at which that happened. Post-Civ is probably the youngest of the subgroups I've talked about in this video too, and therefore is very much still developing. Post-Civ, in my opinion, is probably closest to what most contemporary anarchists will imagine when they imagine anarchy. Something more like Marx's idea that I could fish in the morning, hunt in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, and do critical theory at night, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, shepherd, or critic. Only this time it's you and your mates hooking up an old Wii U to a solar battery and using it to have a smash tournament once you're done making dinner together after a day out foraging for mushrooms, and there's no fear of work the next day. post have somewhat relies upon the idea that civilization is bound to collapse under its own weight, and that we should all be prepared to build something new from the ashes, although I don't think all post civ folks would see industrial collapse as a necessity for its realisation. It's about scavenging from the ruins of the old world in order to build a new one. It's fairly easy to see how you'd reach that conclusion right now with the world the way it is, and post-civ is actually not that far off in sentiment from what I think was kind of meant by Deruti's famous quote. It is we, the workers, who built these palaces and cities here in Spain and in America and everywhere. We, the workers. We can build others to take their place, and better ones. We are not in the least afraid of ruins. We are going to inherit the earth. There is not the slightest doubt about that. The bourgeoisie might blast and ruin its own world before it leaves the stage of history. We carry a new world here, in our hearts. It's also contained a lot, I think, in a really thorough reading of Desert, 
which can be extremely bleak to read at times, but contains within it, I think, a hope which post Civ very much embodies. The hope that after the time when civilization is forced to retreat from our lives, leaving a desert in its wake, that gives us the space and often the tools to build an anarchy that is far better than what came before us. Also, the idea that the desert left behind by civilization is not as barren or as lifeless as we would be told to believe, but rather is full of a different kind of life to what we're familiar with. So, I hope this video explained a lot more what anti civ actually is and helped to dispel some of the myths which have been floating around about it online. Even more, I hope that I've given people some of the resources they need to actually learn more about anti civ thought. This video definitely ended up being a bit more of a defense of anti civ than I kind of originally intended. Uh, but I think that's kind of necessary at the moment, and even if you're still very heavily critical of anti civ, I hope this video gave you some actual proper information about it which you can use to critique anti civ seriously rather than based on like a warped understanding of what it is. Um, I, I really want people internally and externally to do some serious criticism of anti civ because I think a lot of them are warranted and there are some pretty serious issues which need to be sorted out. So I won't begrudge anyone using this video or any of the resources which I'm linking to do exactly that in a serious proper way. Um, thanks. Goodbye.